Uh, I'll speak in English just because there might be some English speakers, but also uh, this will end up on YouTube. So it's either a chance for me to become famous or a chance to really screw something up and became, become famous of something else. So firstly, my name is Idas, and that's about it. I'm from, from Call Credit Information Group. I don't like titles or big names or something like that just because I think every person at the heart of it is like someone, someone special, and his title doesn't necessarily mean a thing. So shortly before I begin what I've prepared, I'll tell you about how I ended up here. So basically, my line manager has raised an objective for me to somehow spread what I know to other peoples. And why he said it is because whichever projects I'm on usually get delivered for some reason. I'm not sure why, but they usually get delivered and on time and with good results. And whenever someone else tries that, it doesn't get delivered or it's not that, that of good results. And one time even I had, so we have a program manager of marketing department and I asked him personally, how many bad marketing projects do you have? And he said, no, 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 not many, just the ones I put you on. Because my, my vision was that all projects are failing because whenever I come somewhere, there's some failure, something bad happening. So, so I had this objective of, of somehow telling others about it. And actually, Agile wrote an email asking different companies, and does anyone want to you know, make a talk at Agile? And I just click, yes, I want to send. And after a few days, it hit me, what have I done? <laughs> but it was too late by that time. So I'm doing this because this is my objective raised from my line manager. Thank you, Chris, if you see me. <laughs> so, oh my, Agile. And first and foremost, I would like to look at some history, old history, pretty ancient. In, indeed, if we talk development terms of the technologies rounding up and, and just looking at you know, what actually these guys were trying to do, who, invent, or who started Agile movement and who started the whole philosophy. And if we look at it, we, of course, we see the bold, bold words, individuals and interactions, working software, custom collaboration, responding to change, which is all good, all seems reasonable. However, if we dig deeper, what it's trying to overcome? So it's trying to overcome processes and tools, comprehensive documentation, contract negotiation, and following a plan. And on their own, they don't seem like bad things, you know? Those things exist for a reason. They do, don't seem like a bad thing. So how come these guys in 2000, in, actually it started in 1998 or something like that, but in those ancient days, how come they wrote this, you know, to overcome these obstacles? How did the software development and building hardware go from this, where you have this guy with ideas, this guy with technical knowledge, we're working together, everything's working out, to actually walls between these people, huge departments, everyone having their heads, no one talking together. And actually, it happens even now. So I will tell you a short story about a dev team who was a new dev team hired into company to accomplish a certain project, and they already were versed in Agile, so they knew how to apply Agile, knew what to do, kind of everything seemed all right, and they started their sprints, uh, their iterations, planning everything, the poke, all, all the best things that Agile brings. They did it. They were releasing software, re good software, in good times. The business were happy with the team. They actually were doing what was, they were supposed to do. They talked to the business, analyzed requirements, did their job, and then one day, business came and said, you know, guys, we have this brilliant person in finances who has 20 years of experience. We want you in next iteration to develop functionality that he does into the software. So we don't rely on one person because definitely from business perspective, you are kind of afraid. What if someone drives that person, you know, or just hits that person with a car or something happens? So the request was natural, but if you think about it, so let's take Steve Jobs for now, and you are a company, software development company, applying Agile, 
in any method, XP, DSM, uh, Scrum, whatever, adding prints to it, you use it everything very successfully, and someone comes in and says, okay, Steve Jobs has died, Apple really needs that guy, his ideas. Now it's your task to develop it. And that's basically what was with that team, so, and what happened actually. So they looked at, at first they w weren't very afraid when just some, someone told them what the guy does. So then they went to the guy, and, and of course they discovered that most of his decisions are based on experience, a lot of it, a lot of his intuition, not actual, you know, some kind of decision, if A equals B, then C is correct answer, that's it, you know. It's not that, it's just someone very experienced. And at the age where humanity is able to produce artificial intelligence of only level of B, an insect level artificial intelligence, you know. So anyway, uh, the pre lead developer or whoever was representing the team said, okay, let's try to postpone this. This is a huge task, very difficult. The business said, no, that's it, you have to do it. We pay you money. You were delivering time, it's all right, but we need this. So we started looking at the, the whole functionality, and what happened, so some developers said, okay, let's build a, a kind of language where users can input their business decisions via scripting, some kind of scripting methodology. So, and of course, they were one month in development, two months in development, everything's late, everyone's on that resource, and, and business, had you know enough of it? Uh, that's too. It's taking too long, guys. That's it. We will hire a project manager. Who will? Who is known for controlling teams out of control? <laughs> who can set everything correctly? So we hire this project manager, and uh, he comes in. He uses Jira for project management, and he started forcing everyone entering their tasks very precisely every, every single hour that they spend, it has to be pre-estimated. So they had started having like one, two day estimation sessions every five days or something like that because they had to estimate the tasks and so on. So as it went along, it, the delivery was more and more late and things were not happening. So you know, <laughs> what happens, they said a project manager because he's a trusted project manager, business trusts that person, he's known for solving those kind of problems. What's happening? And he said, we just need more developers. So he started hiring new developers without actually even involving the old team into hiring process, just hiring someone he wanted who would just do tasks, not things for themselves. And then, of course, one of the best developers in the original team left for the company because that was enough for him. And here we have wall building from a successful team and business miscommunication. And when we talk about for developers to communicate well, it is difficult. And why it is difficult? Because developers are a tribe. It's not a nationality, it's not age. We are a separate tribe. And us, for the first developers, selling things to business or trying to sell ideas, it probably was as difficult for this guy who looks pretty much laughable, trying to wear costume, is pretty much how I feel in costume, actually. And, and so, so it's about tribe, it's about culture. It's, it's not that just we are different. We, most of developers are in some way geeky or in some way doing some geeky, nerdy kind of stuff that other people don't usually do, except teenagers, maybe. <laughs> so, so really, world not, does not necessarily understand that we are a tribe. We ourselves, we do not understand that we are a tribe. But if we look at this picture, that's again, that's a tribe in a different company, a tribe of developers. They have some common characteristics, probably those are Americans, like flip-flops and, and shorts and things like that. Anyway, it, it does not necessarily is as obvious with uh, Native Americans in their apparel, but it is a tribe and it's important to recognize it. And if we talk about our history, first people who started thinking, how do we do things different, who came with concept of agile, they were revolutionists. They were people the scale of Napoleon, of Jean d'Arc, and, and such. Because at, in those ancient times, to say, we will not plan ahead, a year ahead. We will not plan three years ahead. We will not do these things, let us just 
do this experiment that no one has done in the world that took great courage. I mean, for some, uh, some business people who are of older kind of structure, uh, mi mindset, they would just fire those developers or put them in the corner in the, somewhere in the basement so no one sees them and hears the idea because they are outrageous. But actually these people, our ancestors of our tribe, the first warriors of our tribe, actually did a wonderful thing. They, they dared to challenge current system. And not only they challenged the current system, they actually, what they did is they showed that developers are not just tools, are not something you can put in a cubicle and tell it to do that. Those are creative people who can do marvelous things if given a chance. And of course, Agile started with different methodologies and things like that. We've seen this picture many times. I will not even go and explain that, unless you want to, no? <laughs> okay, <laughs> probably you've seen that. So what happened, yes, we st the developers started, started going Agile, starting doing Agile trains and everything. We started rolling our jolly ball of snow from a small little ball, to bigger and bigger with more features and everything. And once we have a full ball, what we did usually, is release it. And, and <laughs> who's there? That's our admin, sysadmin or database admin or whoever it is. That's him standing there and looking at, oh my god, you guys are crazy. <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to de deliver that five kilometers from this place on my own? <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> like, fuck you, <laughs> really. <laughs> so, so this is where the term fucking developers, or also known as it works on my PC, came from. Because although we had all these wonderful things, we didn't consider people who I were working with, that they actually, that snowball has to be thrown over the wall. And, and you know, those walls grew, and developers kind of were their own tribe in itself. And if you look at corporate structures, they are pretty much tell you where the walls are. So we have, don't mind the, they just took any slide with corporate structure, don't mind the names. So we have a development branch here. If you want something done, not in development, you will have to go through someone's head here and talk to this guy, and this guy will talk to them and, yeah, achieve the problem, <laughs> solve the solutions. And while we were very happy rolling our balls and doing agile, doing collaboration of a contract negotiation, responding to change of the following plan. Operations teams, infrastructure, they used ETIL over Agile. They used careful planning, processes and tools, comprehensive documentation, and contract negotiations in their work because it works for them, because it's a stricter structure. You have to, have to plan for it. And, of course, uh, market didn't stay in place, so this was a problem that is very visible. And to any team having problems not delivering and writing software, writing the functionality that business needs, but actually deploying the software so that live, it's live, will notice that problem, especially in bigger organizations where you no longer sit opposite your admin and you just go here, hey Thomas, can you do that? Yeah, sure. No problems, but if you look at broader, so hence, came term DevOps. Has anyone heard of DevOps? Probably yes. Anyone? Yeah. So DevOps. DevOps is, if we look at, this, at the description from uh, Wikipedia, DevOps is a concept of solving IT challenges by means of communication, collaboration, and integration between software de where developers specifically separated out some entities who just try to make mess and information technology operations personnel so when did we become no longer IT? Like, what's happening? How come we need collaboration between us and IT? What? What's, what's happening there? So anyway, if you want to read more about DevOps, read this book. It's marvelous. For a developer, it's a very, it's a present. It's a gift that lets you understand your world beyond your Kanban board and your Scrum board, uh, Scrum process and uh, sprints and uh, plannings and so on. So when we talk about 
communication and collaboration. As a tribe, as all tribes go, they have their own language, which we know we have, because if someone tries to sit in a conversation between two IT guys or two developers, he will just probably leave some girlfriend sitting there just... <laughs> You know, so anyway, so people don't not necessarily understand our language. And the thing that we have to concentrate on is uh, co communication tools. Because communication opens different kinds of doors. And first and foremost, the most critical, most important tool is empathy. Understanding what the other feels. It's just not saying the fucking IT infrastructure has screwed up our development because they want to, it's understanding what actually they are facing, because they have their own priorities, they have their own things to deal with, and to know exactly what person feels. You don't necessarily have to be shot in the butt to understand that, <laughs> but you can talk to a person and try to understand what he's going through, and then work out how do you achieve without causing too much pain to, to each other. How do you collaborate, collaborate to achieve each other's goal, and how do you make the goals mutual. So when we talk about empathy and controversy, there's also a good book, The Loudest Duck, and it especially centralizes on different cultures, different, uh, different ways of doing things, and how to accept those things and go beyond them by accepting a difference. The other communication tool that I suggest is metaphors. Developers often speak in very technical terms, and when you try to explain something to your project manager, he will, you know, like, say yes, I understand, oh, very nice, you guys did a good job. Actually, does he understand? So, metaphor or expressing your, your technical terms in a terms that everyone understands, like fixing an engine or something like that, is a very powerful tools, tool and should be used and must be used with business people, especially if they are not from programming uh, background, which it never usually happens, or almost never. Uh, the other thing, a communication tool is a whiteboard, but don't rush to conclusions. Not yet, not yet. So whiteboards, although they are a very nice tool, there are more and more teams that are separated, not co-located, and so on. So what teams do, they usually move to electronic whiteboard, which leaves a actual whiteboard, the physical, just an empty sheet without you know, much to say. Some people start putting user stories, so high-level user stories on them to show some high-level progress. And, and, but that's not that, let's say, this, this view it tells something to the developer, but the high, more higher up level you go, it will tell less and less. And especially if you just have this sprint tasks in here, how do you know the vision? So an example of usage of whiteboard when it's uh, all, uh, all, all, uh, already electronical is actually to paint something on it, which is very nice, or there's a it's not something I would just say start using it. It's just an example of how a board, a whiteboard, can be used. So here, visual uh, means and a metaphor is used to re represent the whole project, and which goes with that we have raw materials, some excavator excavating them, we have input of those raw materials, we have processing of those, uh, quality checking, then production, then we have products, actually. Then we put them into catalogs so people can choose something. Then there's selection, like in a car, you choose something, and then there's shipping. It represents kind of a visual project representation and very high-level things that have to be completed in order to, you know, for the project to be finished. And one of the things you might already notice that, like reporting and configuration, non-existent. It's kind of an instant alert, so I will not be able to configure anything and report anything. What's going on there? So, just an example. Next one is retros, <laughs> which not all teams communicate well in retros. Sometimes retros become a kind of a chore. So, what did you, we do good last sprint? Because we did the same thing over and over again last five sprints. So let's just talk about that and what we should do better and so on. And people start, you know when retro has gone wrong, when people start 
uh, giving cliche answers. The team bonding was very good. The team collaborated very well. We did our tasks on time. That's a good one as well. You know, so <laughs> it's kind of a doesn't give any, any substance to the retro. And when we talk about retros, retros are needed for if we have a world freshly painted, that's how, let's say, that's how we work. However, the time goes on and things around us change. There are new people in different business departments, there are new customers and so on. And if we don't do retros, what happens is, although we do all the same, it's actually outdated already, which is not that visually, uh, <laughs> visually presentable when we talk about how the team works, but that's what actually happens because just things around us change. And, you know, <laughs> the whole point of retro is to actually get something useful. And there are ways to make them more useful. One example, let's say last, last sprint, we had a release into live. So you ask your people not what went well, but, okay, guys, we had a release into live. Now think of an event in human history that would be comparable to our release. Tell that event and tell me why. And someone would go like, oh, it was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It wasn't just one bomb, the firewalls were not configured. <laughs> it were two bombs, the servers as well weren't ready. Didn't have service packs and so on. So, you know, and if we talk about retros, you have to innovate or think of, you know, different things because just asking the same three questions, it's like getting feedback, 360 feedback about people asking, what did he did good this quarter? What did he, should he do better? And what he should keep doing? Asking the same questions again and again is monotony. And when we talk about retros, one more thing is, maybe I was too fast with my slide, I'll go back to that. <laughs> so when we talk about retros, we do everything agile, we do iteratively changing, improving, and we use retro as a tool, but actually we don't continuously improve our retro. We don't consider it to be part of agile then. It's just a tool that we're using. It doesn't have to be improved. We do the same thing over and over again and expect that it will give us positive results. So <laughs> think about retro as a thing that also has to evolve with iteration. It should change art usability, art things. So when talking about just ideas for retros and uh, things like that, there is a, if you just search D school on Google, it, it will give you this. It's a design institute, but they are coming up with different those creative ideas, how to engage people better, how to make sure things work out, how to do things more interestingly. So something uh, to consider. The other thing is there will always be walls. So for example, there's a really nasty architect sitting who nobody likes, but you have to go through him to get things approved. So, you know, that's a wall. And he's just She's just a nasty, nasty man so who knows, no one fires, and he just like to mess around. Okay, have you done this? Does it add any benefit to my project, to my software? No, but from you know, my perspective, it should be done. So postpone your deployment, <laughs> and that's it. So when we talk about these things, it's like overcoming a, a, a certain obstacles. And when, when we talk about obstacles, probably most of you have seen this Diagram of circle of concern and circle of influence. Raise hands who didn't see this. Okay, just a quick explanation. When we talk about proactive and reactive people, they do certain things in certain circles. So circle of influence, it's things you ha can change. For example, the route that you take going home, the food that you buy, the how well you comment your code, and things like that. These are things that you can influence, or you can influence your friends by saying, okay, guys, I really like this structure, and can we, can we try it? And friends say, okay, let's try it, you know? That's your circle of influence. A circle of concern is everything else, what you can't influence directly. It's something like a war in, I don't know, somewhere, or just North Korea businesses, what they do to people. And so these are things that you can waste a lot of energy on but actually have no influence on, or you can spend the same amount of energy on things you can influence and achieve much better results. So when we're talking about circles of influence, one way to overcoming these obstacles, like this architect that nobody likes, for example, 
it's in a sense like in MMO or becoming a boss. So how, how many of you played MMOs? Okay, so there are people. So MMOs is a multiplayer online game. So anyway, so in MMO you have understanding of levels. The higher level you are, the stronger you are. So basically, if you are level one and you try to go to this architect, Stingbeard, a very nice name for it, level one, basically you die. He just one hits you. That's it. Bye bye, developer. Go back to your cubicle. <laughs> so when we talk about influencing people or in increasing your circle of influence, because you can't achieve, can't achieve some things without increasing your circle of influence, what you do is actually you go around the obstacle. So let's say, not exactly around, but you don't confront directly. You gain experience. And the way you do it, so for example, you have yourself here, your colleague here, your project manager here, and here's our architect. And basically, your opinion is worth a one. We are lucky it's not a zero. <laughs> and the other developer opinion is also worth a one. And we have a project manager whose opinion and business knowledge makes him a two. So what actually you do is first, when you have an idea and you want it to go through, first you go to your colleague. Why you go to your colleague? First, to get consent from him. The other thing, most important thing, to get feedback. Because if you don't do that, you can't improve on your, on your solution. And if you go directly to our proposal, if you go directly to go to five, a man who's much more experienced and with yeah, just killing you know, developers. <laughs> so if you go directly, he will find a lot of holes in there, in your solution probably, and will just directly reject you. And what happens then with your reputation, he will think that's a rubbish developer. He's already zero for me. I will never listen to him anymore. So what you do by going to your colleague and explaining like, okay, I have this idea. It might solve the problem we are having. So you get consent from him. And actually when you have already consent from that colleague, your level or strength increases by two. When you go to your project manager, so first you circle through your colleagues to get feedback, then you go to your project manager who has more business knowledge and he can identify flaws in your plan that are uh, from a business perspective flaws. And actually by getting feedback and consent from your project manager, you improve your score to four. So basically you have improved your solution, you have actually improved communication with your project manager and your colleague. And now, with having a four, you might as well just go to the, you know, the architect. And of course, not every time you will be lucky, but it's much, <laughs> it's much more probable that you will be lucky. And I know there are some fives that will never move even if there's 10 in that corner, but we're not talking about these cases. The other thing, a uh, question that I would like to ask, but I don't, need an answer, I just ask, like asking questions without answers. That's my style. That's how I get things done. <laughs> two weeks is, uh, is two weeks sprint long. And before we delve into that, we have to think about just human communication. Why it's so hard for different tribes to communicate? When we looked at the Agile Manifesto, it said collaboration and communication over processes and tools and so on. Why do we have to be reminded of that? Like, we are people inherently chatting without stopping, even men gossiping about other women or other men, what they've done of, in bars, everywhere. We do that constantly. Why do we have to be reminded to do that with our colleagues? And yeah, so, so communication is important, but the other thing of communication aspect, why there was, there was a statement uh, adapting to change versus contract negotiation, or something like that, I don't remember, it were hard, don't blame me. Why was it there? And it's usually because you have to negotiate to finally come to the final conclusion. And why is that? Because we have the biggest strength in our brain and the biggest weakness is our associative thinking. So we think and we correspond to events and to ways by association. So an example here is two colleagues. They used word fluffy in their discussion of a poster. And actually fluffy, for Julie, is her cat, or rat, uh, not rat, that's bunny, sorry, sorry rat. <laughs> so we have this bunny, and of course her association with that word 
is very nice. It's like, brings her smile, my fluffy, and so on. So, so, and on the other half, we have a designer, Tom, and he also had a very nice, cute cat, you know, also named Fluffy, but the cat died. <laughs> and it wasn't very nice. He found him after two weeks all rotting and everything, you know, and it was six years old. Tom was six year old, year old right? And he finds this cat who he can't, can't even say goodbye to because it's too gross, you know, gruesome. So he had a few... I uh, had to go to psychologist and everything. He recovered. Anyway, he's now working successfully. The <laughs> times have passed, gone. So, and they decide on a poster, and that's the result. <laughs> <laughs> so when <laughs> Julie thinks of fluffy kittens, uh, Tom thinks they die for you. <laughs> so you can't go on. Poor, poor cats. <laughs> and so on. So anyway, I, I know it's an exaggeration, but uh, just to prove the point why the contract negotiation in the waterfall times didn't always work for things where people are involved and they're trying to solve a problem, not just to tell, like, like with buildings, you tell an architect, I want a building, just a square box with windows and a roof. That's it, what I want from it. He, will, he can do a project of that with upfront planning, full, full upfront planning, all the, uh, everything included. With people, it's not so easy because of that associated thinking. Especially if the unions will understand us, why our laws are so complex. Because it's very difficult to explain in words what you mean. Because the Lithuanian language is nice to talk, but it's very difficult to express strict things when you mean. It's difficult. It's just difficult. It's, that's why probably we use English. Sometimes English terms in Lithuanian, just because it's easier to explain that this thing that would go so, so, and that so in Lithuanian language is actually one word. In, in English, but that happens in English anyway. So, and uh, the fault is associated thinking. And when, when you talk about uh, tools of communication and asking is two weeks sprint a long time, actually, of course it is, it is a long time, although it's not a long time for development if you need to develop, develop a lot of features. But if you consider the budgets and everything and why businesses might start just like, you know, okay, what's my, with my return on investment? What will happen? If you think about these things, two weeks' time for them is a long time because add up salaries of five people for us, a business analyst of some kind, some business consultant, and a project manager and the testers and everything. You have salaries of eight people times, you know, two weeks or half a month of those salaries, and it's a long time. And it's important, so we have proof, concepts, and understanding of concepts. In, in, in development, when you do some kind of concepts to show off your, uh, uh, your functionality. And it's very just important to say that I kind of adopted the understanding of trailers. So first of all, who writes documentation anymore? If you go online and Google something, how do I fix, I know, offense? And you have a video link on YouTube and a document, documentation, very co comprehensive, like 100 pages, covering every possible you know, way to repair the fence. You would just click the YouTube link, despite that someone spent 100 hours on it. So uh, my suggestion is just stop documenting unless it's very necessarily in written form. Stop writing those wiki pages. Just do a trailer of the functionality. And one thing, it's reusable, you can actually, you don't need to do show and tell to some one person and then that goes to the other person in business, oh, they did something very nice, you should ask for show and tell. Another meeting, full team there, five people, one developer talking, so we have to click this button and when it does this, stop doing that, just add trailers like movies. How do you decide you want to go to the movie? You watch the trailer first, then maybe read some reviews, that's what you do. So same thing with software. Now, I'm almost finished, I promise you, and what I want to talk about, so what is my message here? Do I want you to start using the visual board for the story and so on? No, actually what I want you to get is that when talking about all these tools, empathy, metaphor, circle of influence, creative thinking, what I'm talking actually about, that if you put different stripes on yourself and you make yourself look like leopard, you will never be one. So, let's say business wants a leopard to catch an uncatchable mouse, and they, you know, buy this, 
and say, uh, so is it a leopard? I'm actually talking about developers. Is it a leopard? Are you sure? It has stripes and tail and everything. It's, it's a leopard. You can trust me. Okay. Uh, let's catch our uncatchable mouth because we have a leopard finally. Finally, we have a leopard. So we put the leopard into you know, Savannah or somewhere. They go home, drink tea. So by the time they drank the tea, they say, okay, the leopard should have caught the mouse already. And they come to the leopard and it's running around in circles, chasing its tail. And they're like, we're doing something wrong. We need a trainer for this leopard. You know, <laughs> definitely something. We are doing something not right because we have a leopard who is the fastest animal on earth. So he can catch a mouse. Well, easy. You know, you just have to train him. So you, you are the trainer. And the trainer teaches the leopard to catch a mouse with, you know, something like that. So, and of course, let's say finally, whatever, who is, whoever is acting as a leopard is finally able to catch a synthetic mouse. And they let him out and so on and catch a mouse. The leopard goes away, runs, 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 catches a mouse, and the mouse starts killing the leopard. And business people are like, oh my god, we invested so many money in the training of this leopard. We can't allow it to the mouse to kill it. Let's put some walls around this leopard so mouse can't touch this leopard. <laughs> so what I'm saying is don't just read a book and think that it will tell you, tell you what to do. Read 100 books. Understand the methodologies, why people use those methodologies. Why are they using stand-ups? Why are they using Scrum? Why people who you know, created Agile, why they did that, and start thinking like one, because developers are smart people. They're very smart people. They're excellent at problem solving because that's their day-to-day -day bread, and they can help businesses a lot. But if they think in cliche terms that they read in a book or two, and they're just trying, okay, I'm applying this, it's not working, it should fit. I know it's, it, this is triangle and this is square, but it should fit. No, it doesn't. So anyway, Talking about that. The other thing, why did I talk about tribes, our history, and our heroes that we should acknowledge? Our history is not long, I admit, but it's important to understand that we are a tribe. So when we're talking about why it is important to understand why we are a tribe, it is important because our history knowing what people before us did and why they did it shapes us. <laughs> because just knowing or applying Agile tools is not enough. Do you think that when creators of Agile started the whole process, was it about Kanban boards, sprints? Were those the most important things? No, these are just tools that helped the process. They didn't shape the process. People shaped the process. <laughs> It's important to know them, because Agile was about freedom. <laughs> it was about breaking down those walls, not being in the cubicle anymore. And if we talk about developers, you are Spartans of current days. When people employ developers, they accept, ex expect something from that. And when, what do they expect? They see these wonderful technologies. We just have had some advertising showcasing that you can move your office without doing anything into a mobile application, a tablet, and back to work to your desktop. And this is cre created by developers. So developers are awesome. People see that and they want that. So your responsibility as a developer is to understand that you are a part of this tribe, that you are history, that is your responsibility to defend the honor of the first developers. <laughs> it is really. <laughs> so, uh, that's about the end of my conversation. Be gone now. Uh, really, it's been, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe we have somebody have questions for either. Okay, sorry. Uh, try to run away. I don't like answering questions. Just ask yeah. me. I have one about retrospectives. How you improve it? It's a team effort. You just have to know that you have to improve it. And as I said, asking different kind of questions because, like, <laughs> for example, a, asking, like I said, asking a, 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 about it as an event in human history. First of all. It adds personal interpretation to the whole thing that happened. People don't necessarily say 
things directly. So they, if, for example, you ask, someone asks you feedback about some person who you love, you hate, he's a developer who just sits in the corner doing anything so that, you know, he just gets paid or something like that. A lot of cases, people will just soften the thing, make it look like, yeah, he's okay, or something like that. He's, he's okay. I would not maybe work with him necessarily, but he's okay. That's it, you know. And so metaphors like this, when you're asking about events of the past two weeks in a different form, people usually tell more than they actually understand they are telling. It's more honest in that way, because they don't actually have to say, like, David from infrastructure is a dick. <laughs> they don't have to say it, but they can explain it in a metaphor and would not even necessarily understand that they are actually giving very valuable information. So it's just opening up people, because not everyone is very brave to talk or express themselves. So this kind of just adding kind of flavor to the thing, and it's, and it's up to you just not to accept that a sprint or retro is a retro, it's always standard. Voice it out, it's always responsi all you, also your responsibility, saying what we did bad, our retros suck, I hate them. <laughs> that's, that's a good feedback, you know? and, and it's up to the whole team to think, okay, our retros are not working, how do we, how do we improve things? Let's try this. Let's try bringing pizzas to the retro, so let's try bringing something else. <laughs> okay. Do anybody else have questions? No? No, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aidas. It's a small gift for you. Thank you. Okay. And